Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Monday, April 11th, and it is a very special edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast today as we're joined by Virginia Tech head wrestling coach Tony Roby. Over the next hour on episode 233 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, we'll look back at a very successful season, finishing eighth nationally with three All-Americans, and look ahead to what comes next for this program in 2022. All of that and much more coming up on episode 233 of the Tech sideline podcast which starts right now We welcome you into episode 233 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, however you're listening, whether that's on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Stitcher, or if you're watching on our YouTube channel. If you are, please like, comment, subscribe, and turn notifications on so you know when the Tech Sideline Podcast goes live every week. And if you are live in our YouTube stream, be sure to leave a comment or question for Coach Roby. We'll try to get to some of those at the end of the show. We, uh, as always, the Tech Sideline Podcast, and more than any time, is brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. You can help bring Olympic hopeful athletes to Blacksburg and help build one of the fastest growing wrestling programs in the country. Visit southeastrtc.com to learn more and donate today. We welcome you in. I'm your host, Jake Lyman. We've got a special crew on set today in Chris Coleman's chair today underneath the red shirt license plate. Jack Brizendine, our beat writer for wrestling. In the fourth chair today is our founder and general manager, Will Stewart. Behind the scenes, Malcolm Stewart, as always, our best podcast producer in the land. And so glad to be joined by head coach Tony Roby across the way. Coach, thanks for spending some time with us today. Appreciate you guys having me on. It's uh been a little while so glad to be back and uh, excited to talk about uh, Hokies wrestling and Southeast Regional Training Center and uh, everything we got going on on the mat in Blacksburg. Well first off I want to congratulate you yesterday you were inducted into the Virginia Chapter Wrestling Hall of Fame. Uh, Just what does that mean to you to have that honor especially after also being named ACC Coach of the Year this year Uh, just a big couple of weeks for you in terms of accolades. Yeah, it's definitely an honor and, and something that, you know, um, I, I'm proud of for sure and, and to be recognized for a Lifetime Achievement Award. But, um, you know, for me, you know, I said this in my speech, it's wrestling's done a lot more for me than I've done for wrestling. So, um, you know, I, I want to honor wrestling more than I want wrestling to honor me. So it, it was a cool event to be a part of. Uh, I'm grateful to be inducted with some people that I that I respect and know well and uh, you know it's a great group to be a part of but at the end of the day you know it's about us trying to help people and build relationships and using wrestling as a vehicle to help change lives. Well I mentioned off the top that you guys finished eighth in nationals this year three All-Americans just looking back at this 2021-22 season what were your overall impressions of your program and the growth of it as you try and move forward uh, towards more success in the future? I thought it was good. Um, I, I think as a coach, you're always there's always more. You, you feel like you always could have done more. You could have accomplished more, and, and we certainly feel that way. I mean, we had some. You know, you feel for the guys that didn't get done what they wanted to get done at the NCAA tournament. And I think if we would have wrestled, you know, a, a perfect tournament, we could have had five or six All Americans, and we could have been in the top five. You know, but it certainly could have been a lot worse too. And I thought our guys, um, you know, in particular Bryce and Makai and Corbin, um, did some of their best wrestling at the right time of the year. And you know, that's really what you want as a coach. Um, it's a long season. We start in the first week of November and we mm-hmm. end the third week of March. And you know, there's going to be ups and downs and highs and lows over the course of that time. If there's not, you know, if you're wrestling great all year, sometimes you know. Uh, it doesn't always go as well as you want at the end. You know, you don't peak the right time of year. So I thought we got several guys peaking at the right time of the year, doing their best wrestling. Um, you know, when an eighth place finish and another top 10 finish is certainly something to be proud of as, as a program. I think we're one of four programs in the country that have had three All-Americans or more for the last nine years. The other ones being Penn State, Iowa, and Cornell. So we're, we're among pretty good company. Uh, just speaking on that, uh, you took over five years ago. Uh, how have you been able to build the program up to sort of the caliber that's that it's currently sitting at uh, to get to the point that you're just talking about? Well, I think a couple things. 
you know, I've I've been here since 2006, 2007. That was my first season. So, uh, you know, along with Coach Dresser was, I feel like, a, a pretty big part of what we were able to do in those first nine or ten years to, to get to the point where we were at five years ago. Um, so, you know, kind of had a pretty good idea of, uh, you know, what Virginia Tech was about, kind of what our, our principles, our philosophies, and, and uh, what we're trying to accomplish, what we look for in our athletes, the atmosphere that we're trying to create, the culture that we're trying to create. So a lot of that stuff was already established and, and you know, felt like I was kind of a part of that. Um, but, you know, from then, it's, it's about bringing in really good people and, and have, surrounding yourself with with first class people that are competent, have high character and, you know, can help you build on what we'd already had here. So uh, I think that was the first step is getting the right people in here and, and putting them in positions where they can be successful and then retaining some of our, our guys that had graduated from a program. Ty Walls is still around. Jared Hotz, um, our volunteer coach. Uh, we were able to bring in Cody Brewer a couple years ago uh, to work with our lightweights, who's been a tremendous asset. And then uh, having Coach Freyer um, as the associate head coach has is, is, is been a home run for us as well. So I think it starts with that, having great support, great uh, a support staff in addition to, to our coaches, our strength coaches, our nutrition staff, our director of operations, our media people. So up and down the lineup, it's about building a great team just like any other organization. And I think we've been pretty successful at that. And, and you know, one of the things that I try to do is treat those people right and, and hopefully get them to stick around here uh, for a long time. Well, when you look back at this season, I think there's one moment that stands out in the semifinals of the national tournament. Makai gets a pin and jumps into your arms. There's a really cool video and picture of that. What, what's going through your head in that moment when you see it end, he jumps into your arms and realize that Makai's finally made it back to the chance where he can wrestle for a national championship? It's obviously pretty exciting. Um, you know, just when things change like that in a wrestling match, you know, we, we go from a position that probably wasn't that favorable for us or for Makai. And, you know, Makai, it's funny, he'd been working on that skill uh, the whole year. And, and it's one of the, Makai likes to, he'll work on something the entire year. And a lot of times he doesn't even break it out until he re really, really needs it. And uh, so he had worked on that for a long time and, and for him to be able to execute it uh, at that particular point in the match. And then obviously to get the pin, um, and then just to see the joy, uh, coming from Makai was, was pretty awesome. Um, so as much as anything was just happy and excited for him and, and to see him, you know, show that kind of emotion, um, you know, it, that was, that was probably one of my favorite moments that I've had in coaching over the course of the last 20 years, to be honest with you. And then obviously the match afterwards, the championship match, didn't really go the way that he might have wanted. It was a small margin of small margin that he lost by. What do you say to him just sort of after that, uh, after the run that he made to get to that point and how it ended? I mean, we're just proud of him, you know, and, and care deeply about him. And, and that's that's the way wrestling goes. I mean, you know, obviously at that particular point, it's about what we talk about all the time with our guys is just giving great effort and, and, and going out there and competing hard and doing everything that you can to get your hand raised. And, and, you know, unfortunately that doesn't always happen, right? I mean, the other guy's trying to win too. And, you know, he's, he wrestled a great opponent who was going for a set. They're both going for their second NCAA title. So we knew it was going to be a war and it was a, I mean, it was a fantastic match and you had two guys that are thoroughbreds out there going, going at it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we didn't we didn't come out on top. Um, you know, we had to do a better job in that that overtime ride out period to try to ride a little bit longer than six seconds. Um, but in terms of what I said to Makai, is just that I'm proud of him, and um, you know, he had a lot of adversity over the course of the last year and, and last year at the NCAA championships with the injury that he had. So it was uh, it was just fun to be a part of it. You know, we're we're obviously grateful to have Makai, and we're, and we're fortunate to have Makai as a part of our program. He's one of the best competitors that I've ever coached, one of the toughest people that I've ever coached, and obviously his results, you know, speak for themselves for for what he's been able to do in his time here at Virginia Tech. So Tony, let me let me jump in and ask you a couple. Um, uh, hopefully, this won't get you fired up and have you have you go on. But the the rule that he lost on. I don't know if it's called criteria or technicality or whatever. What are your thoughts on that, particularly in something like a championship match? Um, what do you think about that? You know, it's 
I think at some point you have to figure out a way to decide the match. So um, right. I, I didn't, we knew the rules going in. You know, we talked about it. You know, with the team. I mean, everybody knew what what it was, and it's the same for both guys. So. Um, I don't have a huge problem with it. You know, we had opera, you know, there, there's a, after regulation, there's a two minute, uh, period on your feet and yeah. yeah, that sudden victory period. And if nobody can score in that two minutes, then they go to the, the, the ride out format. So, you know, that ride out format is, uh, it's probably as fair a way to decide a match as you, as you can at that particular point. I know a lot of people don't like it, but when you have a guy like Makai and Carter Staraki out there, um, they could probably wrestle for 20 minutes and nobody would, could score a takedown. I mean, they're, they're just both that hard to score on. So uh, I, I think that uh, I think that you have to figure out a way to decide it. And mat wrestling is certainly part of it. And um, you know, unfortunately, it just didn't come out our way. Okay. So the other thing I want to ask you about about Makai is um, it, it surprised me, and I think it surprised a lot of people to hear him say after the semifinal that uh, he almost gave up wrestling in the middle of the season. So let's let's drill down into that a little bit. Um, I know it, it may be difficult for you to speak on behalf of Makai, but uh, what, what's your take on that? Because I, as far as I know, nobody really got into the details of it with him either there or afterwards. Yeah, you know, I think um, I think something that people don't understand, fans don't understand, they just see these guys on Friday and Saturday night when they're competing and um, – you know, and, and not just Makai. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of guys and a lot of athletes that have ups and downs and have similar struggles to every single everybody else in society. And Makai is not Makai, and our guys aren't immune to that. And um, last year was really hard for Makai with you know with the injury that he had. I can tell you that COVID was tough for Makai, you know, when, when it first hit and the, and the isolation and just kind of things shutting down, he probably struggled with that a little bit more than, than some of our other guys did. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things that, that have played into his kind of emotional state over the course of the last couple of years. And, you know, as a part of that, I think Makai, you know, ha- had, had one point during the season where, he probably had, uh, you know, a, a tough weekend and was struggling a little bit. And, you know, he uh, he deals with that, and I think he deals with it well. But at the same time, um, you know, Makai is a very uh, emotional kid. He thinks a lot. He's very sincere in, in how he approaches things. And I think, you know, he was probably just in a, in a having a weak moment and yeah. you know, that happens, right. And that happens yeah. to all of us. It happens to, to me. It happens to, to every guy in our program. So, um, you know, it was a situation where, you know, we just kind of had to sit down and talk through a couple things. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, once that we, once we got through that and he understood that we understand where he's coming from and, and this, you know, kind of where he's at emotionally and mentally, uh, I, that that helps him a lot, yeah. and you know that's just the just the nature of the beast when you're going through a, a wrestling season, and and wrestling is incredibly hard, right? And there's a lot of pressure when you're when you're Makai Lewis. There's a lot of pressure, and yeah. you know that's that's sometimes harder to deal with than people may realize. So I you know I tell people all the time wrestling is the toughest sport from the outside looking in, and I think football is probably second toughest. Um, so immediately fans start asking questions like, oh. Is he coming back next year? So, again, not wanting to put you in the position of speaking for Makai, but where do you think he is right now as far as coming back next year? And, oh, he's coming back. All right. No doubt well, it. I got to ask the question. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. Hopefully I got to ask the question. he's coming back for two more years. You know there are fans who are cheering watching the, watching or listening to this right now. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be back. He'll be back, and he'll be better than ever. He's, uh, he's as motivated, and um, he's he didn't miss a beat after the NCAAs. I, I think – I think getting that win was validation for him too, to getting back to where he knows he's capable of being. Um, and then the loss in the finals, I think is going to be a motivating factor for Makai. You know, um, that's his first loss at the loss at the NCAA tournament. And uh, I can tell you this much. Makai Lewis is, you know, his competitive spirit is as good as anybody I've ever been around. And, um, sometimes that makes it hard too. Like sometimes that's where the pressure comes from and that's where some of these internal things that he places upon himself come from. But it's also what makes him great too. 
So um, Mikhail will be back. He'll be better than ever. He's, you know, he's been in there working his butt off um, since the NCAA tournament. All right. Appreciate it. Well, Mikhail, clearly a fan favorite. I want to transition over to another fan favorite. I, I love watching Mikhail wrestle, but my favorite wrestler to watch is Bryce Andonian. He's just so much fun when he's on the mat. Uh, what does that bring to this team, especially trying to maybe build a fan base that comes out and, and increasing the crowd year over year in Castle Coliseum? What can a guy like that do for you? Yeah, I mean, I hear that everybody I talk to tells me Bryce <laughs> Andonian is their favorite wrestler to watch. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no question. We, we, you know, when we recruited Bryce, it was it was obvious that he had a style that was electric, and and uh, we knew that in addition to being a great wrestler, that he would be a fan favorite just by the way he approaches things, and um, you know, he's not afraid to throw it out there, and uh, that you know, that's really what you want from your athlete, somebody that has no fear, and you know, he's. Um, if he's going to lose, it's not because he's going to take his foot off the gas or it's not because he's not going to be aggressive. Uh, he's going to go out there and he's going to, you know, he, he would rather lose by 10 than by one. Um, you know, so, uh, Bryce has been tremendous, uh, in terms of helping us build our fan base and, and, you know, kind of build a, a brand of wrestling that's exciting. And that's something that we, we really try to do too. I think it's important for our fans um, you know, that when they come to Castle Coliseum, that they're entertained. And that's what we want to do. And I also think it correlates to success at the NCAA tournament um, when you have that kind of style and you're not going out there and trying to be calculated and try to win by one point and, and over you know, scouting it and overthinking it and over evaluating it. Um, and, I, and I think that's what really helps us a lot at the NCAA tournament is just having guys that can cut it loose and go out there and, and uh, wrestle with without fear. Um, so, yeah, Bryce has been tremendous. I, I'm, I'm, I was super excited for him, the way he finished the season. You know, he had kind of a heartbreaking loss in, in the semifinals in a match that I thought that, you know, he uh, maybe we didn't wrestle the smartest match in the world. But with Bryce, you got to take the good with the bad. And that's just who he is. And if you try to take away what he's good at, it, it's probably not going to go well. So occasionally it, it you know, you know, bites you in the ass a little bit. But, um, you know, for him to come back and, and take third place, I mean, he had a phenomenal NCAA tournament. He, he really did. And he did a great job the second half of the season with his discipline, 149 was not an easy weight class for him to make by any means. Um, you know, and to make it three at the NCAA tournament, you have to make weight every day. So you get a pound each day, but you know, after after Thursday night, you got to go back and get your weight down. And he had to weigh in at 150 on you know Friday morning, and then he had to weigh in at 151 on Saturday morning. So you know, he's as much as seven or eight pounds over when he, when he's done wrestling, gets back to the hotel and has to go get that weight off. So for Bryce discipline was incredibly important. And that, that's kind of the message that we had to really, uh, pound home for him is that he's got to have great discipline this year. And, and, and we knew if he did, if he did things right and he had great discipline, we felt like he could win the nationals or be in contention to win the nationals. And, and, uh, I think it kind of, you know, played out that way. Uh, another guy who pro doesn't have as much as a uh, flashy sort of style of wrestling, but is just as dominant, uh, Corbin Myers, just sort of talk about his sort of uh, tournament run and then also just as a whole, his impact on the program. Yeah, Corbin, you know, Corbin's a seventh year guy. That's crazy to say. <laughs> um, so you know, really happy for him. You know, he had a he, he suffered a pretty significant neck injury about three years ago, and uh, he you know, we had to make a decision as to whether he was going to um, kind of hang up, hang up the wrestling shoes and kind of figure out what surgery that he wanted to get. There was a couple different options and um, he ended up or we ended up deciding to go with something that's a little bit less invasive um, and, and it worked out really good. So he took that year off, um, was able to get it back, got a medical for it and, you know, came back and ended up being a two-time All-American for us, um, which was, you know, fantastic. When he transferred here from Edinburgh, we knew Corbin had was a great athlete and he had tremendous ability, but he, he overcame some things um, that I think were holding him back. And uh, it was very rewarding as a coach to see that and be a part of it and watch him develop his, his mental game more than anything 
and in his wrestling game too. His wrestling improved significantly. Coach Brewer did a great job uh, helping him develop his wrestling skills. If you watch him, I mean, he does some things that uh, you know were just really slick and explosive and great speed and um, timing on his attacks. And he's uh, he's fun to watch. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy you out there and you're like, wow, that was that was really nice. You know, that's 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 a highlight type of uh, move that you just hit there. So. Uh, yeah, Corbin was tremendous for our team. Great leader, great person. Um, you know, I think he's probably going to stick around in in Blacksburg and and help us in some capacity next year uh, and work for the Southeast Regional mm-hmm. Training Center. So we got to keep those donations coming in. We got to got to pay Corbin Myers. So, well, w- good time to remind you. Mm-hmm. Tech Sideline Podcast brought to you by That's the right. Southeast Regional Training Center every time and especially today. We'll we'll plug that a few more times before we get out of here. Uh, so those were your three All-Americans we talked about, Lewis, Andonian, and Myers. I want to check on some other wrestlers this year. Sam Latona, uh, high expectations coming into the year, and maybe he struggled a little bit early on, but he found his stride later on in the season. What exactly w- would you say happened there to, to allow him to improve throughout the season and end uh, in a better way than he began? I think, I mean, anybody that's close to our program or knows a lot about wrestling knows that Sam, I mean, he's like six foot tall. Um, (laughs) 125 was really tough weight for him to make. And um, I, I, you know, when you're going through the season, you don't necessarily want to acknowledge that maybe it affected his performance. But I think, you know, looking back at it and evaluating it, I think it certainly had a lot to do with um, with maybe his inconsistency a little bit, you know. And and he did a tremendous job managing the weight, his discipline. He's as disciplined as anybody that we have in our program, and um, he's as tough as anybody we have in our program. And he didn't, you know, he he never complained about it. Um, he was a pro. Um, you know, he did it the best he could. But I, I know that the weight. Um, played a factor for sure. And, you know, with not just when you step out on the mat and you don't feel great because, you you know, you you haven't been able to put a lot of calories in your body, a lot of water in your body, but it affects your your training and your practices too and your preparation. So I think it was a combination of a lot of those things. Um, He'll he'll definitely be moving up to 133 next year. And I think think that'll be a good move for him, um, you know, for him and his wrestling and just feeling good. And and when he steps out on the mat, having high energy, and that's his style of wrestling too. He's a high energy, high pace guy. And when you take that away from him, uh, it probably affects him a little bit more. It's not like he's, you know, Bryce can maybe get away with a little bit more because he's so athletic and, um, you know, it maybe doesn't affect him quite as much. I can't imagine that six foot 125. That that's, <laughs> I'm sure he's happy to be moving up to 133, uh, and, and Connor Brady as well. Maybe some inconsistencies there as well, but he showed some flashes. Another one of those young guys who I'm sure you expect a lot from going forward. Yeah, he started the year off. We were really pleased with how he started the year off. You know, had a great first semester. Um, and to be quite honest, second semester just I don't I don't know exactly why or what happened, but didn't didn't perform the way we felt like he was capable of so um you know he's got to have he's gonna have to figure that out and he's gonna have to make some adjustments and improvements and um again it's it's uh nobody really cares about what you did in march or who you lost to in a close match those things don't matter and you know to me it's about how we finish the season how we compete at the end of the year and uh you know so that's what we're looking for out of connor brady is is to be able to sustain that level of intensity that level of focus the entire season um you know and do his best wrestling in march uh, another guy i wanted to touch on clayton Olray. you know he had a pretty pretty uh up and down year but you know he definitely showed that he can compete at this level uh what do you like about just sort of his year and his uh, what he did at the 165 spot. Well, I th- you know a couple things that you know Clayton is is uh, he reminds me of Cody Howard a little bit. You know he, his, he's always going to give you great effort, and um, there's some wrestling positions that he needs to improve in. Um, there's some things technically and strategically that he can definitely do better. Um, but his effort and his you know what he puts into the sport of wrestling and the way he competes is something that you always feel good about. Um, but that being said, you know if we want to get to the level that, you know, for him to, to accomplish his goals, which are pretty lofty, he, the, that he's going to have to make those improvements and those adjustments. And uh, this time of year in the off season is, I think, is when he can make some great strides. And he's a great worker. Um, his desire is really, really strong. He wants to be great. So I think he'll make some adjustments. You know, he, 
he's probably a little bit small for the weight class, um, quite honestly, in, in, in his style of wrestling where he's kind of a power guy. Um, it probably affects him a little bit not being, you know, more of a 57 than a, than a 65. Um, so, uh, you know, but he just needs to keep getting better, you know, but I know he'll work at it. I know he'll, his commitment to it is going to be strong. Well, coach, we've got a lot still to go here. We want to talk a lot about what's coming up next year for your lineup and where the program's going from here, but we're going to take a quick break here on episode 233 of the Tech Sideline podcast. Again, brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. We'll take a break. We'll have more with coach Roby coming up right after this. Stay with us.
We welcome you back in to episode 233 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, a very special edition with Virginia Tech Wrestling Head Coach Tony Roby on set. We've already looked back a lot at last year, but we're going to look forward now. And again, this podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. So Coach Roby, you told us in the first half of the podcast that Sam Latona going to move up from 125 to 133. We're going to go rapid fire through these weight classes for next year. What's 125 going to look like now that Latona is moving up? So we, we have two um, good young kids that I think are going to develop into being really good college wrestlers. Um, a kid named Eddie Ventresca from New Jersey who redshirted this past year. And then also a kid named Cooper Flynn. Um, both were true freshmen and redshirted. So uh, those guys will battle it out and, and kind of figure out who, who the guy is at that weight class. But uh, we have a lot of confidence. I mean, they're going to be young. They're going to be freshmen. But... At the same time, both have tremendous ability, mm. and we feel we feel comfortable with what they can bring to the table for us at 125. Um, you know, Eddie's a great athlete. Uh, he uh, has a tremendous skill set. You know, he's, he reminds you of Corbin Myers a little bit in terms of his athletic ability. Um, Cooper, you know, same thing, great athlete, but also tenacious and just wrestles hard. And he's really, you know, he's, he's a kind of a mean guy and, um, he's not afraid to go out there and, and turn it into a fist fight. And, uh, so we like, we like that about Cooper as well. And, and, uh, you know, Coop's got great work ethic and wrestling's like, you know, really, really important to him. So, uh, I think, you know, one of those two guys, we will have some depth there, which will be good as well. So. Uh, I know you said Sam was going to obviously move up to 133. At 141, uh, will it be Colin Girardi again? Or I know Sam Hill, I guess, got a lot of good work next year. What's it looking like at 141? Uh, Colin Girardi will likely be, you know, be the starter at 141, I would anticipate. We've got some freshmen coming in, a um, kid named Tom Crook out of Florida who's pretty good, who I think is going to be a 41-pounder as well. Um, you know, we'll see he's a four time uh, Florida State champion. You know, he's placed at every national event uh, as, as a high schooler. Um, we, you know, we'll add some depth, but uh, I would anticipate Colin being the guy again at 141 uh, next year. And, you know, Colin needs to continue to develop and get better. And, and you know, he's, he's certainly improved a lot over the years, but uh, he's got high goals and, you know, he wants to be on the stand at the NCAA tournament. And in order to do that, he's got to. He's got to develop some go-to attacks where he can score some more points, and you know he can't. You know when you when you put yourself in these situations, you're in close matches all the time. Um, it makes it tough to win, especially at the NCAA tournament. And we talked in the first half a lot about the next three weight classes: Bryce Andonian at 149, Connor Brady at 157, Clayton Olry at 165. Do you kind of expect that's going to be the the set line up there, or maybe some weight class changes there? No, well? I, I Bryce will likely move up to 57. Um, we've got a true freshman coming in next year at 149, okay. kid named Caleb Henson from Georgia, who. Um, I don't know that I've been as excited about a recruit coming in as a true freshman in a long time as I am about Caleb Henson. He's he's the real deal. So um, I think you know more than likely, uh, unless something changes, Caleb is is you know in my opinion probably the favorite to to lock down 149. You know something could change, and there may maybe we can get a, a transfer in for a year and, and afford Caleb a red shirt, but. As of right now, you know he's kind of the guy that we're looking to um, to to step in, and you know we've been around Caleb enough and, and have seen him, you know, train and compete, and um, he's the real deal. So excited about what he brings to the table at 49. I don't think I don't think we're going to have a huge drop off there, to be honest with you. Bryce will move up to 157, and then Brady and uh, Ori will probably fight it out at 165. I, I would imagine. And just have to ask, uh, Makai stays put at 174. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And then um, who – do you have an idea in mind of who will replace Hunter Bowen at 184? Is that something you'll sort of figure out? As the Hunter Bowen's coming back. Hunter so, B yeah, he, he told me yesterday. I got a phone call from – a text from Hunter. <laughs> we talked about it after the NCAAs. And, um, yeah, so he's, he's, he's coming back. So we're excited about that for sure. Well, that's uh, two good two good news for our fans uh, on the podcast today. Makai and Hunter Bolin both coming back. Uh, what about one ninety seven? What do you expect that weight class to look like next year? Probably be Andy Smith and and Cody Howard fighting it out uh, again. You know, Andy Andy Smith is uh, somebody that we didn't get to see a lot this year. You know, he just had a bad bad some bad luck this year. Really, um, he got hurt in the wrestle off, so he was out like the first you know three weeks month of the season. He came back. He got COVID. 
So he was out. He, he, he got contact trace and then he got COVID. So he was out with that. Um, and, you know, and then he hurt his shoulder at the end of the year. So, um, but you know, he, he, when he did wrestle, he competed, competed well. I and mean, he went to the Southern Scuffle and placed the Southern Scuffle. And um, every time him and Cody wrestle, have wrestled off, it's always been incredibly tight. So, um, you know, we feel good about what we have there. We feel good about the depth. You know, Co- Cody Howard is obviously a fan favorite. Everybody lo- <laughs> loves watching the junkyard dog go out there. And, um, you know, he's usually losing by that, like that six kid in is the first N- period. That kid is NIL waiting to happen. Yeah, he is. He is. And, he, and listen, he's an incredible kid. And he's, you know, one of the most likable and lovable guys that, that we have on our team. Um, and his work ethic is tremendous. And, again, you know, we, we talk a lot about just going out there and guys giving – given effort, you know, and in whether Cody wins or he loses, you can't ever feel bad about what that guy puts out there. I mean, he's, he's just a tremendous competitor and his toughness and his work ethic is are, are really second to none. Um, so, um, you know, both those guys need to continue to develop. I mean, Cody's obviously got, got to get better on bottom. His bottoms killed him, um, you know, over the course of the, of the, of the season this year and, and really cost him probably, you know, a, a trip to the NCAA tournament. Um, so, you know, there's areas where those guys need to improve, but I, I know they're going to put the work in and, uh, you know, I, I, we feel good about what, what we have there. So th- those guys will, will do a good job for us. And then rounding out at heavyweight with uh, Nathan Traxler exiting, who do you have, who do you feel is best suited to take over? Hunter Katka. Hunter mm-hmm. Katka um, will, will be the guy. Um, would still like to develop a little bit more depth there, to be honest with you. But Hunter redshirted this year, so Hunter's technically a freshman next year, and he's in his third year. He wrestled the the year that didn't count. Um, I guess they called the COVID year. I don't, I'm not sure. And then uh, redshirted this past year, and then then he'll be the guy next year. So um, he was second in the ACC as as a true freshman. Um, and, you know, lost in overtime in a match he easily could have won. And he's a great worker and, you know, continues to develop. And, uh, you know, so so we've got a lot of confidence in Hunter as well. So there you go. And a good early look for the fans at what the starting 10 could look like next year. Uh, I wanted to ask about some of the younger guys, maybe that won't make the starting 10, but wrestled unattached this year. Was there anybody who stood out to you that maybe is coming up and could play a factor, if not next year, but the year after? Yeah, you know, we've got some guys that I, I feel good about um, the depth that they're bringing right now to our program. A kid named Ty Finn and Jackson Spires um, did, a, did a good job for us this year. I want to make sure I don't leave anybody out here. Um, you know, the, those two guys in particular, uh, Sam Fisher um, at 184 is somebody who's placed at a, a lot of the open tournaments and uh, has, has a lot of a potential and ability. And, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily see him stepping in and beating Hunter Bowling or competing with, with Bowling, but uh, it's going to be a great depth guy. And, you know, Bowling being in his Latin in his, in his six year two is somebody that we will probably give some breaks to, and, you know, maybe not wrestle all the time um, because of that. And Sam will be, will be, will do a good job filling in uh, assuming he, he can, you know, earn that second spot there. Um, one thing I do want to ask about, speaking of the untouched wrestlers, how important are those events during the year for those guys, like the Southern Scuffle and just stuff like that towards their development into starters? Yeah, really important. I think, you know, our sport's a little bit unique in that sense where um, if you're not the starter, you can still you can still get 20 to 30 matches in a year uh, by going to these open tournaments and, and the NCAA uh, has has uh, allows us to do these extra matches too for kids that aren't redshirting. So, but the kids that are redshirting get to go and they get to wrestle in you know three or four or five open tournaments. Um, so it's great for us to be able to evaluate them, and it's also just great for them to be able to compete. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it, it gives them something to dial into to be focused uh, for during the season. Uh, to keep them accountable. Otherwise, you know, if you're redshirt and you can't compete all year, it's it's a tough year to get through that. So, uh, I think you know that's that's a pretty cool thing about our sport that they have the opportunity to go out and compete and wrestle as much as they get to wrestle and and really get an extra season in there. I mean, we've had guys that have have redshirted. Um, you know, Cooper Flynn probably got twenty some matches in this year. Uh, a bunch of those guys where um, you know it just adds to their development. It gives them the opportunity to get a taste of what college wrestling's all about before it really counts. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important. 
Well, I want to talk about your recruiting class as well. You talked about how Caleb Henson could step in at 149, but some other big names in there too that are yeah. going to be coming in. What are you expecting from this year's <clears throat> class and, and what they can bring uh, towards the future of this program? Yeah, we you know we have another great kid too um, named T.J. Stewart who's uh, wrestled at Blair Academy. Um, he's from he's a Virginia kid originally, and we're super excited about T.J. He's won just about everything mm-hmm. there is to win in high school. Um, he's probably going to be a 97 pounder. You know, we'll likely redshirt TJ um, just because we we feel pretty good about what we have. But we'll see. You never know. I mean, you know, he he's uh, he could definitely be the guy at 197 too um, if we choose to go that route. We'll kind of have to see where he's at. Um, you know, we're not 100 percent sure what weight class he's going to be yet. He's 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 a uh, He's a little bit shorter than most 97s, but he's, you know, he's a thick, athletic, explosive kid. He can, you know, he, his athletic ability, he reminds you of Makai a little bit with his athletic ability. I mean, his lateral motion is fantastic. He's, you know, he's got great leg attacks for a big guy. Um, you know, one of the better athletes in the country at, at that weight class. So um, he's super excited about about TJ coming in, I think he's going to be a you know if not an impact guy next year, he red shirts and he'll be an impact guy after that. So and I mentioned Tom Crook from Florida, who we have coming in. Those were our three uh, signees in November. We've added to that a little bit with some some uh, you know some uh, commitments here recently with some uh, you know walk on guys and some uh, guys that I think can can help us as well. Um, one recruit we haven't talked about yet is your son who announced his commitment about a week ago. Um, just what's that like for you having your son join the program and uh, just, yeah, just sort of your thoughts on him joining. Um, you know, I'm excited for him as much as anything. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have been able to say for sure that he, he would be a division one wrestler and he kind of is a late bloomer a little bit. He just kind of started taking wrestling serious probably in the last year and a half or so. So his his growth in that time has been pretty significant. So for me, you know, uh, happy for him, the way the the, the uh, progress that he's made, the success that he had this season, uh, the confidence that he's built this season. Um, you know, he's been coming over and training with the, with the regional training center in our room a lot here in the last year. And I think that's helped him. Uh, a lot with his confidence and, and, you know, he looked at a couple other schools. I made him go look at a couple other schools just to make sure that this is where he knew he wanted to be. Obviously all he's ever known is Virginia tech. Um, we moved down here. He was like three years old. So, uh, you know, he's been a hokey his whole life. I think this is a lifelong dream for him. So, uh, that, that part of it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I, I, I try not to coach him too much. I'm, I'm trying to be his dad more than his coach. So hopefully I can continue to do that. Even when he's in the room uh, with us on a daily basis, I'll let somebody else coach him. So um, so, so I got to cut in here. Did you uh, send him down to NC State to uh, go through the recruiting process with him? <laughs> <laughs> he did go to West Virginia. A, a good buddy of mine coaches up there. Um, so he went up there and took a visit up there. And he, and he went down to App State and took a visit down there. And, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think at the end of the day, this is where he knew he wanted to be. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier on my pocketbook here too, at Penn State. So <laughs> yeah. that's, that's not the worst thing in the world either. Easier on yours and on the wrestling program's pocketbook. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. You know, um, so yeah, so we're excited. He, he, he's likely going to take a gap year and, and do what we call a gray shirt year, um, where he just trains with the training center and takes classes at New River and then enrolls the following year as a freshman. Um, just from a development standpoint, I think that's probably the best move for him. And we had to make sure before we got on here that being his dad comes before being his coach and you can actually talk about his commitment yet. But yeah, I think I can, I, you know, I hope so. If not, <laughs> I'll, we'll get slapped on the, the wrist, I guess. <laughs> Well, this podcast is brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center, so I want to give you a second to, to talk about that. Uh, if people are going to donate to the Southeast Regional Training Center, uh, what can that do for your program and continuing to the upward trend uh, of Virginia Tech wrestling? And we actually have gotten a lot of questions about some things that are going on with the SER, S, SERTC, so yeah. Yeah, so obviously it's 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 a – organization it's a 501c3 that's separate from virginia tech i mean that's one thing that i think you know people that you know the diehard wrestling fans understand that and know that but it's it's a critically important organization for uh for wrestling in this area it provides opportunities for 
uh, high school kids that qualify, they can come in and train with us um, with our RTC. It provides opportunities for guys like Ty Walls, who's, you know, um, been competing and trying to make Olympic and world teams and national teams for the last several years since he graduated from Virginia Tech in 2017. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a big part of what we do. Um, it's certainly when high school kids are looking at where they want to go to school, having a, a, a strong RTC in their backyard um, is an important part of that. And we've had, we we're fortunate enough to have uh, James Green with us for the past two years. James was, his, he, he made the world team six times, um, was a world uh Silver medalist, world bronze medalist, you know, and, and quite frankly, on any given day, is the best wrestler in the world at, at 70 kilos. His, his, uh, his effect or his influence on Bryce Andonian and Makai Lewis and a lot of these guys, you know, it's been very impactful. So having him here was was great. Unfortunately, um, James called me last week and he's been dealing with some hip injuries. Um, that are going to force him to retire from wrestling. And he's also recently taken a job at the Olympic Training Center as the developmental coach um, in Colorado Springs. So as much as we hate to see James leave, um, his impact here was tremendous. I mean, it was it was a great relationship for the past two years. Uh, he helped our program a ton. Hopefully he feels like we helped him in his quest to get better as a wrestler. Um, but he's going to be taking that position out there, which isn't all bad. I mean, it's nice to have a guy that we know well that's going to be in that position and we trust and I think that believes in our program. Um, you know, basically his job is the developmental coach for USA Wrestling is to be working with the best uh, cadet and junior level wrestlers in the country. So basically, you know, high school wrestlers in the, in the country. So he's going to have his hands on a lot of those kids uh, at training camps, coaching their teams, traveling to the junior world championships, the cadet world championships um, with those guys. So, uh, you know, we, we look forward to leaning on him to help us in the recruiting process a little bit with those kids and, and hopefully uh, helping direct some of those kids maybe to Virginia Tech down the road. But, uh, you know, getting back to the, the regional training center, really important part of what we do. Obviously, um, Obviously, fundraising is a huge part of college athletics, more now more than ever, right? So the Southeast Regional Training Center plays a huge role in, in that part of it as well. So it's something we need to uh, not only maintain, we need to grow and develop it and take it to another level. So that's kind of what one of my focuses is right now after the season is to get out there and beat the bushes and do a lot of fundraising. We've got a, a couple fundraising events planned. Um, we're going to do something out in Virginia Beach here before too long where we do kind of just a meet and greet, a dinner and, and, and a happy hour type of thing. Um, we're going to do an event uh, up in Botetot County at a place called The Preserve um, where we do some skeet shooting and have a couple other things and, and uh, a dinner and, and a happy hour and kind of talk about the Southeast Regional Training Center. So people that are fans or listening to this of, of wrestling or if you're not, if you want to get involved, keep an eye out for, for information coming soon on, on those events. And we also do a golf outing. Um, in the fall every year too. So very cool. And if you just want to donate again, southeastrtc.com, uh, you can go there today and continue to help the SERTC continue to grow. Um, one just big picture question I have for you. Uh, what's like the biggest point of emphasis for the program heading into the off season? And sort of if you could describe like the goals for the program as a whole heading into next year. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, it's, pretty general, but it's just to continue to improve and get better. Um, you know, when you look at specific areas on, on the wrestling mat, um, I, I think a couple areas that, you know, maybe we got exposed in a little bit, especially at the end of the year is, um, our bottom wrestling needs to continue to improve and get better. Um, you know, we had some guys that, uh, you know, it, it cost Sam Latona and to be an all American this year, his, his bottom position. So, um, that needs to improve. Cody Howard, obviously, you know, the, the bottom wrestling hurt him. Makai in the finals, um, you know. So that's something that, that we need to, to spend some time on. And it's, it's a position where nobody really wants to work on it. You know, it's a lot more fun and guys enjoy working on their feet a lot more. But you have to have the discipline to get in there and, and do that and, and make it a point of emphasis. Um you know, we've identified a couple areas, you know, just with our hand fighting where we feel like we can get better, um, you know, keep in better position. 
um, are, are some things and finish and takedowns. I mean, those, those are pretty basic things, but they're, they're very fundamental to the sport of wrestling. But at the end of the day, that's what wins. I mean, you know, it's, it's just like any other sport. You gotta, you gotta be great at the fundamentals. And, um, you know, so we'll spend mm-hmm. some time in there. Uh, you know, obviously we're going to work on some freestyle stuff. We've got, we've got six guys, I think going out to the U S open at the end of the month to compete. Um, maybe eight guys, two in the open division. And then I think six in the junior division. And that's huge too. Like, you know, looking back at the last couple of years, Makai Lewis who made the junior world team and, and one was a junior world champion. Bryce Andonian made the junior world team was, was a junior world bronze medalist. So that experience and that exposure that they gain on those teams and competing in those events is critical for their success in folk style wrestling. So that's uh, that's an emphasis point of emphasis as well. But you got to balance it too. You, you, you know you don't want to do too much freestyle and neglect the folk style wrestling because they are different, right? And at the end of the day, we're trying to win championships for Virginia Tech, and um, so we have to balance that. Um, outside the wrestling room, you know, fundraising is is, is huge right now. Um, all this NIL stuff is 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 you know it's not only hitting football and basketball; it's hitting wrestling. So that's something that we need to capitalize on as much as as, as much as the NCAA rules allow us to to do so. Um, so that that's something that's definitely um, new and different, and everybody's adapting to that and trying to figure that out in in every athletic department and every sport. So we're we're no different, you know. That's something that that we talk about a lot, and you know, we're trying to figure out the ins and outs and, and how we can how we can help our athletes in that area and, and take care of the guys that deserve to be taken care of, um, right? Based on what they've done for Virginia Tech wrestling and, and and how they represent our program and our university and and how they compete when they step on the mat. Um, so those are really the big ones. Recruiting is, is 24 seven, 365. You know, we're always, you know, we had a prospect camp this weekend where we had, uh, some really good young kids and freshmen and sophomores, um, which was great. Cause you start to, you, you, you can kind of build a relationship, um, legally with those kids, um, before you can recruit them when they come to your prospect camp. So that, that was good to get, get in front of those guys and have those kids get in front of us. So. You know, those are kind of the the staple areas that we're we're constantly trying to improve and get better and enhance. A lot going on as you guys work towards next season. Obviously, a long off season to go. Before we get out of here, Tech Sideline has a very loyal wrestling following, and I want to hear from some of our fans uh, on the message boards and in the YouTube chat. So I know Will's monitoring those in the fourth chair. So that's my job. Um, <laughs> so looking through, uh, I put it to the uh, wrestling message board last night, asked for questions, and, and we've gone over the vast majority of them. This is very specific, kind of getting down into the weeds. Um one of our posters wants you to talk about stalling and the questions he asks are what's the approach for coaches in dealing with stall calls are there certain tendencies for certain referees that the coach something i don't know i think he meant he left out a word or something or is it something you deal with matches in progress so if uh, stalling is a hot button issue for you that's kind of your jumping off point and you know it is a little bit um i for me I, I think um, that that the majority of our guys wrestle an aggressive style and they so go too. out yeah. and they try to attack. And to me, stalling is pretty simple. Like you know, if if you know anything about wrestling, if you're an official, if you've wrestled, it, I don't think it's that difficult to figure out which guy's trying to score points and which guy's not trying to score points. Assuming assuming at least one of them are trying to go out there and score points and and get to attacks. And um, so. Uh, you know, personally in my own wrestling, you know, I tried to attack a lot and score a lot of points and, and, and it, it's a lot harder to do when the other guy is not coming after you and they're, they're being defensive. Um, so, you know, within our conference, I don't think they do a great job of calling stalling. I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I mean, it's, it doesn't happen nearly as much as I think it should happen. And, um, you know, so for me, you know, if our guys get hit with stalling, I, I don't really complain about it too much unless I think it's really egregious because I, I just feel like, um, you know, we're on the other end of that a lot more than, than you know, I feel like we should be getting the stall calls more than we're getting called for stalling. So, um, and, and, you know, I, I'm a big proponent in, in referees calling stalling and, and forcing action. I'm not saying they have to get overly involved in the match, but at the same time, uh, people want to watch, you know, they want to watch Bryce Andonian wrestle, right, for a reason. And, yeah. and when you don't call stalling, 
it doesn't – I don't think it helps our sport. It makes it boring. Um, nobody really wants to watch two guys go out there and stare at each other and, and not do anything for, you know, minutes at a time. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely something that's frustrating for me at times. Yeah. Um, and I can say being being kind of a – I wouldn't say novice, but I don't know a whole lot about wrestling. It is definitely different to watch Bryce Andonian versus watching some of the heavyweight matches I've seen where two guys just kind of lean in on each other for <laughs> seven minutes and it winds up two to one or something Heavyweight's like that. Heavyweight's a different animal. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, so this is uh, – going back to the regional training center, um, this is something that I, I don't know the background on this question. How will the new rule changes for RTCs negatively or positively impact – Virginia Tech Wrestling and the SERTC. Um, well, so the rules, first, first of all, what are the rule changes? The rules have not been changed yet. There were some rules that were proposed that would not allow um, high school wrestlers to train at RTCs. Hmm. Um, or let I think the other rule is that, that, that college coaches can't coach high school teams. Like So right currently – um, you can have a college coach go go coach a, a junior or cadet world team or even um, they have a big event out in Fargo, North Dakota every year, the junior nationals, and the, you, you wrestle for your state. So college coaches could coach those state teams. So that's one proposal that they're, they want to eliminate the ability of college coaches to coach those teams, which I don't have a huge problem with. Um, the the not allowing high school athletes right now if you qualify for rtc if you live within 250 miles of blacksburg um if you place in the top six at the freestyler greco state tournament um and you have a usa wrestling card you can come in and train with our rtc at our designated rtc practices i think it's a good rule i think it's helped it helps high school wrestlers tremendously it probably benefits other programs a lot more than us because you know you know there's not you can draw 250 mile circle around Blacksburg and the wrestling is a heck of a lot better if you do that around Penn State or right. Ohio State the high school wrestling is than than around Virginia Tech it's just the reality of it um so but but I'm not in favor of that I I, I think you're gonna you know hurt high school kids and it's gonna you know hurt their opportunities to improve and get better um if anything, I'd like to see them eliminate the 250 mile radius um, to just you know even the playing field a little bit for that. But though the, that the, that has not been voted on, it's been tabled, so we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. All right, we've got about maybe about 10 minutes left, and something that you and I talk about all the time. So your biggest rival in conference is NC State down in the state of North Carolina, and you and I talk about there are some inequities in the way things work in the state of North Carolina and the way they work in the state of Virginia, the way things work at NC State versus the way they work at Virginia Tech. And specifically, it's got to do with um, the amount of money and the direction that comes from that can be applied towards a student's college costs. So uh, in, in as much as possible in, in an eight to 10 minute time frame, uh, let's talk about some of that. Um, something that that we've tried to make our fans aware of is that in the state of North Carolina, it doesn't matter if an athlete is in state or out of state. I don't know that that's true. The, I, I'm not positive on that. I, I think athletes in the entire state of North Carolina are billed at the in-state rate, even if they're from out of state. We've talked about this with football, yeah. uh, you know. Um, so there's that. And then there's also, um, you know, I don't want to lead you too much. So kind of talk about the challenges you face as a program recruiting against uh, uh, states and institutions where the amount of aid that can be applied to a particular athlete is different. Yeah. So first off, you know, the, the whole in-state thing um, for for North Carolina schools, I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure that, that I, I have, you know, I don't know that that exists for sure. I've, I've heard multiple things on both sides of that. So. Um, but, but what I do know is the NCAA a couple years ago, they changed a rule, um, where you can now combine scholarship with institutional financial aid, right? There's, there's two different kinds of financial aid that you can get that any college student can get. And a lot of people are aware of this, right? You go out and you fill out your FAFSA and you can, you can receive a Pell Grant and your Pell Grant can be as much as $6,000. But then there's there's also um, several institutions that give really good institutional financial aid, or or it may come from the state. 
non-athletic. Non-athletic. Yeah, that, that's a, that, that any student is eligible. You don't have to be a student athlete. Any student is eligible for. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's applied for you know financial aid at Virginia Tech knows that it's not very good, um, right. what we have to offer here. And there's other institutions, and, and you know you mentioned cause the North Carolina schools are, are very good, but there's other, you know, not just them. You know, I know Michigan has really good uh, institutional financial aid. Um, there's a lot of private schools that have these huge endowments, right, that have incredible institutional financial aid. So what happened a couple of years ago is the NCAA changed the rule where you could now combine institutional financial aid and scholarship, right? So Athletic scholarship. Yeah, athletic scholarship. So for, for uh, you know, a, a handful of schools, it, it was kind of a game changer, right? So now, um, in addition to the 9.9 .9 scholarships that, that you have in the sport of wrestling, you could also, uh, you know, I guess stack that scholarship money with whatever you qualified for in institutional financial aid. So um, it's not hard to figure out if you go on a school's website and you just go to their financial aid calculator and you type in income levels, it tells you how much you would qualify for at those schools. So in our experience recruiting against a handful of schools, um, you know, they have a, they're able to do a lot with that, right? And it allows them to extend their, you know, money that they give. Um, you know, kids don't care if it's financial aid or if it's athletic scholarship. I mean, in a lot of cases, the, the financial aid is better because you can't lose the financial aid. You know, scholarship, if you do poorly in school or if, you, you know, something happens where you're not, you know, you get in trouble or something like that. I mean, you, you, there's kids that lose scholarship money, right? Yeah. So, or if you quit the team, you still have the financial aid, right? You still have the institutional financial aid. So, you know, for them, um, it just allows them to, you know, go out and, and it's not hard. Just look at recruiting classes. And when kid, when, when they're bringing in eight, nine, 10 kids in a recruiting class, um, you know, that they have some, uh, they have some advantages in like likely in in that area right you know and, and we have a lot of advantages here at virginia tech too so i don't want to sound like you know this is you know we're complaining or this is you know we feel like we don't have a lot to offer we have a ton to offer and, and our institution is unbelievable our campus is unbelievable our facilities are great you know within the athletic department we offer you know the, this nutrition dining center has been a game changer for us um but that being said you know um it it, it is certainly in my opinion, an advantage to, to the institutions that have what they have, you know, what we're talking about in place, right? Yeah. And there are other schools that I know, you know, they, that can get in state. Some, some of them are after a year. Um, that's a big deal too, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, Virginia Tech out of states, it's about forty-seven, forty-eight thousand dollars for the so, school yeah. here. Um, it's a lot of money, right? And if you're not on significant amount of scholarship, it, it's hard to get those kids to, to, to come to school here. Um, you know, as, as much as they love it, um, it's just, you know, money talks, right? So it's, it is what it is. So what are the differentiators for Virginia? So that, that part of the playing field in, in a lot of instances is at level. What are, what are the advantages to Virginia Tech that help you overcome that? What, what, what's, let's say a, a recruit just to, to put it bluntly, it will cost him more money to come to Virginia Tech and be a wrestler, but he comes anyway. Why is that? What is it that sells this program? Well, I think the people, right? I mean, the people is a big part of it and, and them feeling really comfortable and feeling like, you know, it's a culture where they can be successful. And, you know, I try to convince kids not to, um, you know, you don't want to count every dollar. If you're making your decision solely based on money, you're probably making a bad decision, right? You got to go where you can be successful. Yeah. And that, that's something that we try to pound home with them. But that being said, if it's, you know, $30,000 more a year or times that times five, it's a lot of money, right? Yeah. Um, and then those, in a lot of the programs that have these advantages also have great programs too, right? I mean, they have a lot to sell from the wrestling side and the things that we talked about as well. And their coaches do a great job. And um, so, you know, I think at Virginia Tech, it, it's, you know, just like every student that comes and looks at this place and is around it, you know, it's, there's something special about living in Blacksburg. And, and I think anybody will probably all of us sitting in this room agree with that. Um, something special about going to Virginia Tech, um, you know, something special about the atmosphere and, and the, the culture at this school. And, you know, we're, we're able to, uh, I think, close that gap with some of those intangible things that we have um, in place. And, and I think when people come here, they feel that. 
um, and they want to be a part of it. You know, that being said, uh, we have a lot of kids that feel that way, want to be a part of it, and they can't be a part of it because the, the financial side of it is challenging. All right. Appreciate you addressing that in depth. All right. Well, I think we are just about out of time with you, Coach Roby. We appreciate you coming on and wish you luck moving forward in the off season and towards next year. Appreciate you guys having me. Thanks a lot. Well, I want to thank everybody else on set as well. Jack Brizendine making his podcast debut today, our wrestling beat writer. Will Stewart doing a great job in the fourth chair today, moving on. Sure, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Stewart, behind the scenes, our best podcast producer in the land. I'm your host, Jake Lyman, signing off on a very special edition of the Tech Sideline podcast brought to you by the Southeast Regional Training Center. Enjoy your start to the week, Hokies fans. We'll see you next time.